Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Plant Powered People podcast episode with your hosts, Michelle Kane and Tony Okamoto. We just wrapped up a season that is all about us. First, we're asking what we want for Christmas and, and Hanukkah and Hanukkah. <laughs> and and then we're thinking about what we want for ourselves in the new year. And now we want to take an opportunity to think about ways we can give back that are in line with our values. And often when you first become vegan, something that you try to do is find all of the vegan things. But what is more impactful is to continue being part of your own community, being active and influencing them with your new plant-based lifestyle. And so we are bringing on this wonderful, wonderful guest named Nikki Nariton, who lives in New York. And we're just so excited to have her share her experience working in the soup kitchen, getting plant-based options there, as well as in her synagogue. We both are super inspired just from recording this episode, so I can't wait for you guys all to listen. But before we dive in, we want to give a big thank you to this episode's sponsor. You have heard of them before if you listen to our podcast, Osea Malibu. They are an awesome skincare company. They are sustainable. Every product is packaged sustainably, often in glass and wrapped in paper. Um, They're non-toxic, cruelty-free, vegan, made with love in California. And they um, sent us some products that we've been using nonstop. I am, as we're recording this, still super pregnant. Like <laughs> so really super pregnant. Really my super my pregnant. belly is busting. <laughs> uh, it feels like it's going to tear at the seams, but it hasn't yet somehow magically. And I don't know if it has anything to do with this essential hydrating oil from Osea that they sent that I've been smearing all over my belly pretty much every day. It comes in this little portable package I can just drop in my purse. And when I'm feeling like and my skin needs a little TLC, rub this on and good to go. And I can tell everyone that her tummy is looking really good. <laughs> really good. As well as my face. Last time we recorded about Osea, I had just started using it. And I'd like to report that my face still looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> and by my face, I mean skin. Yeah. But anyway, it's we're so passionate about putting our dollars into companies that are conscious and kind and sustainable. And Osea Malibu is all of those things. If you want to check them out, they're kindly offering our audience $10 off your first purchase of $50 or more. And that'll be automatically applied at checkout. If you go to oseamalibu.com slash plant powered podcast and Osea is spelled O-S-E-A inspired by the C. Now on to our episode with Nikki. Welcome to our show, Nikki. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. It's so great to be here. I'm really excited too. So a little backstory is we heard from Nikki's husband, Ted, who really sang her praises. And I I think that that is so sweet. You guys have been married for 22 years. Is that right? Correct. And he shared about the work that you do in your community and how you have made plant-based changes everywhere you go. So we're really excited to dig into that. But before we do, we want to first hear about where you are right now. Like physically or? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Where are you physically? Let's start there. Oh my God. Um, So I'm in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and I've been living here for the past uh, almost 19 years. And I grew up in New York uh, City, the Bronx, and then my parents moved to a suburb, Rockland County, uh, and then little bits of travel in different places, a few years in Southeast Asia, school in Michigan, and then I'm back in New York. That's exciting. I used to go to New York every year when I was younger. I used to think I wanted to live there. (laughs) And Uh then since going vegan, like more than a decade ago, I have not been to New York and it's like the Mecca of, of plant-based foods. So I am dying to get there one of these days. Well, you definitely have a place to go and a guide because me and Ted would love to take you around to the wonderful veganness that is my neighborhood even. Oh, thank you. It has been incredible. Now, did you grow up eating plant-based? Oh, God, no. (laughs) That's so funny. I I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, I grew up in the the 70s and 80s. You know, I I was born in 65. And so, you know, really like that was the, the prime time of doing the very fast food, easy, quick meat-based meals. You know, we were throwing TV dinners in the oven. My mother was buying barbecue chickens and big steaks, you know, and, and eating everything that's processed and boxed. So I had, I, I didn't, I don't even think I knew what a vegetable was. 
Until when? Oh, <laughs> I think <laughs> until I grew up. Wait, so, you know, probably when I lived in Taiwan for uh, a couple of years. And so I probably knew more about vegetables living in Taiwan just because I had a lot of plant-based um, you know, just kind of, you know, Chinese slash Asian food, um, when I was living there. So much more interested in eating vegetables. And that, that was my early twenties. That's really interesting to me because we grew up in California where produce is so abundant and affordable. And, and so my grandparents, we grew a lot of our own food and, and then there were a lot of farmer's markets. There's a farmer's market here every day during the summer. But then I read this cookbook called the Moosewood cookbook. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I do. I know that. Yeah. I really like that cookbook. It's a vegetarian cookbook that was written. One of the first ever yeah, maybe, published. Yeah. It's, it's, maybe. It's an older 70s or something. Yeah, it's an older cookbook, but she talks a little bit about a similar story where it was in the time of TV dinners, all of her produce came from cans or mm -hmm. frozen. And so the first time she ever experienced fresh produce, she was just really thrilled. So that's 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 cool that you too have come to love produce even though you didn't grow up with it, I can see how it's like a, a big change when it wasn't something that you grew up eating. Absolutely. And Moosewood, when I was like starting to eat a little bit more plant-based was definitely the only game in town. I mean, she really wrote, you know, fantastic books. And then she would talk about like, you know, Moosewood holiday dinners. And so that was, that was really it. And I think that was based on, you know, either some kind of inn or some bed and breakfast that she was cooking for or a restaurant, but, but really that was it. When you started learning to eat or learning to cook with produce, did you start exploring vegetarianism at that time? No, not at all. I'm like, I was very, very carnivorous until two and a half years ago. Like everything, I was eating everything, you know, like I just, I, I would eat the vegetables and I would eat the salads, but I really was like happy eating everything else. That's for sure. So I wasn't exploring any plant-based lifestyle at all until my 16 year old at the time came home about two and a half years ago. And she said, you know what, mom, I'm going vegan. I'm not killing any more animals. I'm not killing the environment. Watch this documentary. And that was the time when what the health came out and then you decide. And I watched the documentary and I was like, no, don't make me do it. I was like kicking and screaming and, you know, but my daughter is a dancer. And so I knew that if she were going vegan and I wasn't doing this with her, that she would end up just eating like a bunch of pasta and potatoes and bread and whatever, you know? And so I thought, you know what, I'll do this with you because you're probably right. And I'm going to support you here. And then we went vegan that day. You're a healthcare professional. What was it like to watch What the Health? Uh, you know, I, I, I just didn't realize, and I think that's what we all say, like, oh, I just didn't know that was going on. Or, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, milk has all this, you know, pus in it or that antibiotics are being used for animals or, you know, all this water and all this, um, you know, growth hormone and all this, whatever they're eating. Yeah, I, I just said, I didn't know. And my, my daughter looked at me and she's like, you knew you were just being stupid. So, but I really <laughs> don't think I knew, you know, I just wasn't sure. So it, it was, it, it was new to me, you know, even having gone to medical school, even having practiced for 20 years, it was still new to me. And I was just floored with how I felt like I just didn't know these things. Yeah. I mean, I think, <sighs> Even if we have inklings of like, mm, there's missing information here, uh, most of us sincerely have no idea what's going on. Like the information isn't out there unless you happen to stumble upon a documentary like What the Health or something like that. Um, but I want to go back to just the really beautiful element of you joining your daughter on this adventure. That is such a special thing that so... So many young people decide to embark on a plant-based journey and do it alone, or maybe they're lucky enough to have some friends, but it's, it's pretty rare to have, um, parents and family members like join them in that. So that's so beautiful and special. And I also know that we have at least a few listeners who are parents whose kids have gone plant-based and that's why they're listening to this podcast is to mm -hmm. find out like, how can I support, you know, my daughter, my son, whatever, who's making these lifestyle decisions in a, in a positive way, um, whether that means going in it with them or maybe just like finding little ways to support. So that is so cool. 
Yeah, it was the best thing I ever did because it wasn't only like something that we could do together, but I, I always say that my refrigerator turned into a garden as opposed to a more, like I was eating more things and different things than I had ever eaten. I learned to cook so much better than I had ever cooked before. And the food tasted it so much better. So it, it was totally a win-win. And then all of a sudden I was kind of living my ethics. So, and then I got involved in activism. Like it just, it was just this windfall of wonderfulness that just continues to grow and grow and grow. And I just never even thought that I, my life would go in that direction. So it's been great. What were some resources that helped you when you were trying to support your daughter and learning how to be plant-based yourself? Well, because I am in this field and I feel like when you're doing something that's fringe in medicine, that you have to know everything. Like all of a sudden you have to become the evidence-based guru for something that you know intuitively is correct. And the other things you're doing, you don't have any evidence for. So I just like swallowed all the information I could. And so Michael Greger became a really big you know, person that I listened to. And then I was listening to all the fantastic YouTube people like Earthling Ed and, you know, um, any, anybody else, Joey Carpstrong, anybody else who can kind of help me talk about this stuff in a way that, you know, I, I sound knowledgeable. And then I'd watch every documentary. So I just kind of like devoured tons and tons of information, which I feel like everybody who goes plant-based all of a sudden decides to do because they want to be able to talk about it and not be tripped up on certain things. And um, so that's what I did. So Michael Greger was a really big one and he's got that nutritionfacts.org. And I, I just tried to like get every resource I could, Dean Ornish and undo it and Caldwell Essendon and the, you know, China study. I just was trying to get as much information as possible. And then you felt prepared to take on all of the doctors <laughs> who were like, what are you doing? I felt prepared somewhat. I mean, I'm a family doctor, so already there's a little bit more room within my profession for activism and doing something outside of kind of the norm. I do a lot of a lot of things like that. Like, you know, I, I learned acupuncture when I lived in Taiwan. And so for my patients, I'm always doing acupuncture if they've got any lower back pain or neck pain or whatever. Um, I'm presently in homeopathy school. And so I'm just trying to figure out how to do as much outside the box and then all this, you know, plant-based lifestyle medicine. So a couple of things that I did is I got in touch with a couple of the plant-based doctors that are around me, like um, Michelle McMacken, and we meet every once in a while and her team from the lifestyle medicine and people at Bellevue. And then um, I was listening to nutrition rounds with Danielle Bellardo. And so there were lots of physicians that I was trying to, you know, at least get in my sphere or know a little bit so that I could not feel so alone in the physician world. And then I was just getting like a group of vegan allies to, you know, go out and do some advocacy with or talk to. So I think that's really great. And actually, that's why we brought you onto the show because of your activism and because of how you inspire people within your own communities. And first, I want to talk about your work in soup kitchens. Helping out people who are experiencing homelessness is has always been a passion of mine. And it's how I got into a, a big inspiration of my work with Plant Based on a Budget is helping people who maybe can't easily afford food. So first, I appreciate all the work that you're doing in that community. It's, it's really wonderful. And then second, thank you for providing plant-based options. Can you talk a little bit about how that happened for you? So I, I've been working, I'm the medical director of the homeless services within uh, this large not-for-profit in New York City. And so I, I see patients at a soup kitchen, um, a shelter, an LGBTQ teen shelter and on the street. And then there are a couple of other sites where um, we have providers that are providing services. And the thought is, is, is that we provide services where people are normally congregating and they happen to be in places where people are eating. Uh, and when I started embarking on a more plant-based lifestyle and I realized that most of my patients are being treated for diseases of excess and most of that is related to animal uh, products and agriculture that I needed to tell them about this new thing that I knew. But then I realized that there was no place where they can go and actually do that. And so I thought, well, what's the point of me telling them what they should be doing 
unless I can provide them resource in order to do it. So the space is now where I see patients. I've been working with the chefs there and the administration there to at least provide like one whole food plant-based option for everybody. And that way I can send them to one of the spaces where they can eat a day to at least have one fully whole food plant-based meal. So that's what I've been doing. Have people been receptive? They are as receptive as they can be given kind of the limited resources they get with food and the feeling in some ways that they can't tell that their future life is that important until they get there. So they're living more day to day and just trying to feel good from day to day. So part of what I've been trying to do is, you know, explain to them how much better they will feel and think if they can start thinking about this stuff. So most people are much more receptive than I think we as doctors believe that they would be. But I think that we doctors don't believe anybody's going to be receptive, whether they, you know, are homeless or not homeless. So I have to just trust that people want to feel good and want to eat the right thing. And that I just have to keep counseling them in that direction. So I almost have to get over my own feelings that I'm asking for too much in order to do that. How were you able to encourage the other people who are putting on these soup kitchens to go in the plant-based direction and offer options or at least one option? I I just, I have a relationship with them and I'm constantly bringing studies to them and talking to them and they kind of can tell that it should be going in that direction. So they've been fairly open. I think part of the problem is there's not a lot of funding for really good plant-based food. And so some of it, they have to find themselves. And the other part is that a lot of the food that they get are are things that are donated and they feel obligated to use. And some of them aren't plant-based and healthy. So I'm trying to help them figure out how to get funding in order to at least supplement whatever it is that they're getting from the community. And most of what they're getting from the community are processed foods and, and lots of animal products. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of a lot of struggle there in making a transition, but I would love to dig even deeper into this and kind of the, the struggle that you've experienced along with the many wins that you've had, because I think it's something that so many people can relate to, even if you're a student in college and trying to work with the dining halls or you're part of a church group and trying to, you know, or you're part of any sort of infrastructure that's already built and a system that's already in place around food. It can seem really intimidating to step in, especially I mean, you're coming in as, as a professional and someone, um, who's already sort of guiding the organization, but, um, what, what sort of struggles have you had in those conversations? What tips do you have for people who want to have conversations with you, uh, in this line, in this line as well? Um, I'd love, I'd love to hear more on that. I think part of the struggle, and especially for chefs that are working in soup kitchens, is that they've been doing what they've been doing for a long time. And so sometimes it's really hard to change and believe that they could make really tasty food. So part of what I've been trying to do is figure out how to get the chef that's been at the soup kitchen that's the most plant-based friendly to visit the chef that's over at the pantry, the food pantry that I go to and teach them about whole food plant-based options. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but that's part of the direction that I'm moving towards. Uh, and then explaining to them the benefits of going in this direction. Uh, that's one way. The other way is to find funding to help, um, them get just better ingredients coming into these spaces that usually are just accepting whatever they're accepting and not getting good quality food. And, um, and then I think the other part, which is probably the biggest part is that I just have to believe that if I keep moving forward and I think of it as like mass action, that I will just continue to do what I'm doing and, you know, and document and Instagram the meals that the chef's been making and putting it on my social media and just keep moving forward, even in the face of people that look like they think it's not going to work in some ways or that the you know, the clients won't accept it or, you know, so, so that, that's kind of how I always function. I just kind of keep moving forward and, you know, keep trusting that if I continue to take action, that there's no way that I can fail. Oh, that is awesome. And so inspirational. And I think it's so, 
it's also true that being the first <laughs> to make a change like that, or when there's not a lot of examples out there of soup kitchens that have been long established that are making these changes, being the first is always the hardest. So you're always going to get more no's. You're always going to get more resistance. It's just right. going to be harder to implement that change. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you're the kind of person like you have been to, uh, be ambitious and, and confident and just keep pursuing and sharing what you know to make those changes. Suddenly examples are set that can then be replicated in other places, in other cities, in other states, even in other countries. Um, and it makes it so much easier for everyone coming next. So that is, that's also something to keep in mind. Like as the harder it is for you right now to make a change, the more you're helping everyone else coming after you. Yeah, no, I'm really, really excited about that. And the other part is that I really like pulling people in. And so I've been running uh, as part of the SAVE movement, something called Health Save here. And so kind of using that organization organization is a little bit of a backdrop and a, a name behind what it is I'm trying to do. And now I have a nurse practitioner who wasn't plant-based before he was working with me. And now he is, he's going to go into some of these soup kitchens and set up groups so that he could teach people about, you know, a plant-based diet and how that's helpful. So I, I think the other thing is to really try to pull people in there with you, even, even when you feel like you can't, or it feels really hard because it is hard to do these things by yourself. Yeah, definitely. Another question that I have um, is that, so this is a really recent change for you. It's been two and a half years now that you've even stepped into the plant-based space, but you've been doing this, this work to help others and in soup kitchens and in your medical career for long before then. So I always wonder, especially as a doctor, when you learn new information that kind of challenges what you had done in the past, are there sort of personal struggles with that? Like, oh my gosh, I used to be guiding people in a different direction that I now know is kind of opposite of beneficial. Did you struggle with anything like that? I try not to look back and beat myself up over places where I, I didn't know something or I directed people uh, in ways that might not have made sense. I, I, I do believe that there's an oppressive system in place that kind of guides us and moving people in certain directions. And so I, I try to be as forgiving of myself as possible and just kind of thankful that at least I found this now. So, you know, every time I have that that hard thought, like, you know, and I, I hear so many people who are plant-based talk about that now, like, God, I wish I had found out about this earlier. Or, I can't believe I was a vegetarian for 20 years and didn't realize this went on. And they really like beat themselves up. And I, I don't think that that's new, this idea about really beating ourselves up for the things that we don't know, or the things we couldn't figure out or mm -hmm. the things we had no control over. So, you know, whenever I'm going to that negative place, I'm always trying to think a different thought about where I am at the moment. So it's always like, I am so glad. I'm here now. I'm so happy that I had this information. I, it's it's just the most wonderful thing to actually like know something real and know I'm heading in the right direction, you know, and that I'm not being manipulated by a system that wants to push us in a direction that's not so that's not so forward and health conscious and helpful. We're so glad that you have found that information too. <laughs> So you're also really active in your synagogue and have made some changes with food there as well. Can you talk about that process? God, I should really get my husband in here because he has made more changes than I have in that process. Like um, our rabbi, who is an activist, was vegetarian. And all of a sudden, I think he went on, it was the climate march, and he heard Greta Thunberg talk and say something, or he saw a sign that said, you know, go vegan or go extinct. And he's like, I don't understand that. I need to understand. And he went and he did a ton of research. And then through the high holidays, he made like this big speech that happens during the high holidays that the rabbis are professing something that's supposed to be helpful and, and make us grow in a certain way, you know, that, that he felt like we needed to head in that direction of going plant-based and vegan and that he wanted everyone to do two meals a day. And then I like, watched and I was crying when he said that because I am the only vegan in that whole synagogue and it's big. It's a big synagogue. And he looked right over at me and he said, Nikki, I'm sorry that it's not three meals a day, but we're starting somewhere like in front of everybody. And 
I said, whatever you do is fine. You know, like keep moving in that direction. Like as long as we know what the end point is and I never want to deny what that end point is, people will move in whatever direction they need to move in. But my husband, who I call the reluctant vegan chef, because when I went on my journey to become plant-based two and a half years ago, I forced him on it as well. Like he is the cook of the house and I needed him to cook for everybody because I was working and he was working from home. And so he went more kicking and screaming than I ever did. I was just kind of like, oh, this is fun. Let's figure this out. He was mm-hmm. kicking and streaming, screaming. But when he heard that the, the rabbi was doing this and that we were going to make these changes over at the synagogue, he like, you know, put himself on the green committee and he became the ambassador of veganism, even though he doesn't call himself vegan, you know, and he, he went and cooked food for the last green Shabbat. So he is totally your guy. And if you, you want somebody on who is like, you know, just your, uh, you know, your, your meat eating guy who, you know, is kicking and screaming and reluctant, but still doing it. He is definitely the one. Awesome of your rabbi. (laughs) I love the ripple effect that has happened. Your daughter inspired you. You inspired your husband. Your rabbi saw a sign and then inspired the whole congregation. It's amazing. It shows that simple acts of, of inspiration can really, really make big changes. Yeah, I totally agree. And and I believe that like every time somebody says, oh, you're not going to make that much of a difference, like each person doesn't, you know, what do they say? It's like 10,000 people to make a huge change. And I just assume that I'm number 10,000 all the time. I'm like, I'm the 10,000 person. <laughs> so I love so that amazing. attitude. Yeah. So, you know, just where people feel discouraged and like they can't do something. I'm always like, I'm number 10,000, you're 10,001, you know, or maybe you're 10,000 and I'm (laughs) 10,001 or whatever it is. I am super curious how your synagogue community reacted when he shared that. Obviously you were sitting there just like, am I hearing this correctly? Is this really coming out of his mouth? This is so cool. And it's validating to everything that you had learned and your, your personal path. But how did the community respond? It was very mixed. I mean, some people were really resentful and pissed off about somebody telling them what to do with their day-to-day life like that. Um, They felt like, where's the evidence? What's going on? And then other people thought, you know, maybe that makes sense. Let's figure out how to make a change. So it was definitely mixed. Yeah, that's interesting. It's uh, a friend of mine wrote an article, Are Jewish Values on Your Plate for World of Vegan? Um, I sent Mm. it to your husband. Um, But it's it's interesting looking back now because I'm Jewish. So I, I grew up you know, going, going to synagogue and going to mm-hmm. Hebrew school and all of that stuff. And ethics and compassion are so deeply integrated into Jewish values. Um, that is not, not really surprising at all. Now looking at all the rabbis out there who are starting to kind of like become aware of these issues and make them prominent within discussions in the temple, but then also like looking to Israel and seeing how in Israel, just the vegan scene is exploding. And uh, yeah, it's really cool to see those, those like values being connected to our food. I remember in, I went to a Jewish middle school and we took Jewish studies. And some of the things we talk about is like, if you find a dollar bill on the street, do you keep it? And it's like, you're like, I, I just found a dollar. Like, yeah, I keep it. But, but then it's like, but what if there's something on it that indicates who this dollar bill is, it belongs to like a phone number or name or something, you know, like mm-hmm. it, these <laughs> things that are just like how to apply ethics to your everyday life that aren't taught in, in schools. But for me, they were very much taught in my years in temple. And so I think that's just cool to see it all coming together in your temple. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's a great place. I mean, it's just a a wonderful place to be, you know, very open and egalitarian and thoughtful and multicultural and always trying to develop relationships outside of the synagogue, which is kind of the way we have to go. I mean, I think, I think when you're a scared group that has, you know, had struggles in the past, the, the thought is that isolating would be best, but I think we need to go in completely the opposite direction. Like we just should all know about each other and stay really connected and figure this out. So that's, that's what I usually think about stuff like that. In addition to at your synagogue and at the soup kitchen and at your practice, what else are you doing? I I know that you, you have a a band. I'm really curious to know a little bit more about that. And, and do you at all use your band as a form of activism? 
Oh my God. Any way that you can get a, a message out or a word out is the way to go. Uh, so I have a band right now that's been together for the last couple of years. I've been in bands on and off for many, many, many years. And um, we just put out a new album, which is on all platforms called uh, Elemental and the band's called Nikki and the Human Element. And the songs are kind of about many different life themes. So I always say like, I'm not singing about love and love lost and in, in my twenties or, you know, or young angst in that way, but more about, about social and ethical issues, but not, not in a preachy, you know, kind of way. And, um, and so every, every other month I have a gig at a local club, a tiki bar called Auto Shrine head and they give me the back room and I line up a night with a bunch of friends. And usually I'll have some vegan entrepreneur there kind of exposing people to vegan treats. So last time we had, um, Jillian, uh, from Vegana Sabrosa there and she brought empanadas and pumpkin, uh, vegan pumpkin cheesecake and sold them to people there. So, and then we're always doing sock collections and whatever else we can do, but it's really just about bringing people together and sharing ideas and, and showcasing small vegan entrepreneurs who are interested in, in growing. That's really cool. Tony and I love to talk about, and feel like it's really important to talk about how oftentimes when you go plant-based or vegan and learn all these things, you want to find the vegan community around you. And that place feels very safe and comfortable and like you're amongst people who get it. <laughs> and so you end up spending your free time at vegan meetups or at vegan restaurants or at like all of the specifically vegan things around vegan people. And we both feel it's so, so important to t a continue the life that we've lived our whole lives <laughs> and our communities and our groups and our um, side projects and everything. Um, but that it can be even more impactful when you take the things that you're already doing and the communities you're already a part of and just find little ways to integrate, um, you know, who you are, what you know, <laughs> into, into those spaces. And you're just such a beautiful example of, of doing that. You know, you didn't feel like you needed to leave your soup kitchen because they're not all vegan and start a new little micro organization organization uh, that's mm -hmm. like a vegan soup kitchen you're going to be able to impact far more people by by con by continuing being an inspirational part within the organization that already exists and i think the important part of that is that you had already established yourselves in those yourself in those communities and were a credible force already and to use the connections that you've already built and not have to go out and not only compete with those, uh, those people, but to bring them along on your journey is just such a beautiful story. Thank you. Yeah. It's such a great opportunity. Like I have, like you said, all of those connections because I'm older. Like I started this at age, you know, 53 and now I'm 55 or close to 55, you know, so I, I get to incorporate, but the other part that's really fantastic about being older and doing this and also like, you know, having a medical degree is that people don't question me. Like I see them questioning my daughter as a young person who's like, you know, just kind of fringe at the moment and she'll get over it at some point. Like I can Hell, because she's a strong activist and very liberal minded and people somehow believe that she's going through a phase and she'll get over it. And I feel like I'm just her like touchstone, like, no, nope, it's not a phase. And this makes sense. And nobody questions me. So I really enjoy being this age and starting this and having all that behind me because I don't get questioned about like what my choices are and whether they're, you know, kind of flighty, you know, quick decisions that have happened. Like they are well thought out and they're always researched. That's really cool that you can be that person for her. I, I had a different experience where my dad, mm -hmm. I've been vegan now for going on 13 years and wow. my dad still believes it's a face. So, <laughs> oh my God. so oh I, God. I'm sure she really appreciates it. And, uh, and we appreciate you for coming on and sharing your story and for inspiring others to remain in their communities, use their connections and do good. I, I think what you've accomplished is beautiful. And Michelle and I are always looking for ways to give back and to talk about other ways people can give back in their community. So thank you for coming on and sharing your story. 
I, I just really appreciate you guys. I mean, from the second we heard about you and the second, you know, my husband listened to your podcast and then, you know, we're seeing your books and we just really appreciate the perspective you're giving. And what I was thinking is that maybe I could, you know, I'll get a copy of the book and bring it to the soup kitchen and I could start giving that out to the chef, like the different recipes that would be inexpensive and easy to make for them. So at least, you know, some of the options can happen quickly and maybe not even have to be thought out so fully beforehand. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. Tony is like blushing over here. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like that would be like your dream of who you want to reach with, with the place uh, on a budget. Wait, when are you so coming to New York? Wait, you said you hadn't been in a while. Wait. Michelle, well, I don't know when Michelle's going, but I likely will be there in 2020. So I will definitely connect with you. Oh, that would be so. And I was really excited to see that Michael Greger wrote the forward of your book or the, was it the forward or the intro? You know, that was just really exciting because he, he put a great thoughtful spin on, on, you know, what your book is trying to do. And I hadn't heard him do that. And so I just, I'm so happy for you guys, just total inspirations. And it's just great. Thank you. We're, we're supposed to be giving you the kind words. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but, the kind words can go back and forth, you know, like you need to keep doing your good work and I'm doing my good work. And with kind words, we might be able to keep moving forward. So oh, I love that. Um, before we close, do you have any final words of inspiration for those listening who want to uh, lead a life, a kind life, maybe a, a more involved in their community life, anything to do to do good in the world. I still believe that thing about, you know, kind of mass action that, you know, if you believe something and you know, it's right, that you just keep heading in that direction and trust that you will get where you need to go. And any time the discouragement kind of comes in and creeps its way in, you know, somehow figure out how to move your way out and keep moving forward. And you will always get there. And no time limits on things either. Like nothing has to happen in a certain amount of time. I think that always makes it really hard to move forward because we believe that somehow if we don't do it in a certain amount of time, we failed. And it's just not true. That's really beautiful. And and lastly, you mentioned you have an Instagram. Where can people follow you? So there's a couple of Instagrams that I have. And so the health save NYC is probably the Instagram related mostly to the plant-based um, thinking. And so that's usually a lot of recipes and I'm interviewing that chef at the soup kitchen often and really trying to help people become plant-based in an easy way. That's really accessible. So I'm always putting on what I eat in the day, the food that I'm making in the morning before I exercise and have ready to go once I leave and stuff like that. So the health save NYC. And if anybody, you know, wants to listen to my new album, it's um, Nikki and the human element. And the album is elemental on Spotify or any other platform. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your time and words with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And you guys got back to me so well and good luck with everything. Thanks, with the baby. And, oh my God. <laughs> thank so you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. I really loved that episode with Nikki. It's so easy to get caught up in our own lives and what's happening with us and how our bad days can be the worst. But to think about the struggles that other people are happening are, are having and how we can help them and use whatever privileges we have to pay it forward is just a really good reminder. So thank you, Nikki, for, for giving us that. Yeah, I feel really inspired to go volunteer at a soup kitchen. <laughs> Tony, we should go do that. We should. And <laughs> it's nice to know that there are there will be opportunity for us to make an impact for animals as well and, and serve plant-based options. Yes. I hope you guys all feel equally inspired. Um, before we close out this episode, we want to remind everyone to check out Osea Malibu, our sponsor. Our sponsors are like the lifeblood of this show. They only come on occasionally, but we're so, so grateful to the support of Osea. Um, if you want to check them out for awesome vegan cruelty-free skincare, it's oseamalibu.com slash plant-powered podcast. And you will also find all the resources that we talked about in this episode there. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash plant powered people. <laughs> and we always love reading your reviews. Thank you very much. Hope you guys have a beautiful day and we'll catch you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.